the money changers were gathering strength fast. They began a periodic fleecing of the flock, as they called it, by creating economic booms followed by further depressions so they could buy up thousands of homes and farms for pennies on the dollar. In 1891, the money changers prepared to take the American economy down again, and their methods and motives were laid out with shocking clarity in a memo sent out by the American Bankers Association, the ABA, an organization in which most bankers were members. Notice that this memo called for bankers to create a depression on a certain date three years in the future. According to the congressional record, here's how it read in part. On September 1st, 1894, we will not renew our loans under any consideration. On September 1st, we will demand our money. We will foreclose and become mortgagees in possession. We can take two-thirds of the farms west of the Mississippi and thousands of them east of the Mississippi as well at our price. Then the farmers will become tenants, as in England. These depressions could be controlled because America was on the gold money standard. Since gold is scarce, it's one of the easiest commodities to manipulate. People wanted silver money legalized again so they could escape the stranglehold the money changers had on gold money. People wanted silver money reinstated, reversing Mr. Said's Act of 1873, by then called the Crime of 73. By 1896, the issue of more silver money had become the central issue in the presidential campaign. William Jennings Bryan, a senator from Nebraska, ran for president as a Democrat on the free silver issue. At the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, he made an emotional speech which won him the nomination entitled Crown of Thorns and Cross of Gold. Though Bryan was only 36 years old at the time, this speech is widely regarded as the most famous oration ever made before a political convention. In the dramatic conclusion, Bryan said, We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. The bankers lavishly supported the Republican candidate, William McKinley, who favored the gold standard. The resulting contest was amongst the most fiercely contested presidential races in American history. Bryan made over 600 speeches in 27 states. The McKinley campaign got manufacturers and industrialists to inform their employees that if Bryan were elected, all factories and plants would close and there would be no work. The ruse succeeded. McKinley beat Bryan by a small margin. Bryan ran for president again in 1900 and in 1908, but fell short each time. During the 1912 Democratic Convention, Bryan was a powerful figure who helped Woodrow Wilson win the nomination. When Wilson became president, he appointed Bryan as Secretary of State, but Bryan soon became disenchanted with the Wilson administration. Bryan served only two years in the Wilson administration before resigning in 1915 over the highly suspicious sinking of the Lusitania, the event which was used to drive America into World War I. Although William Jennings Bryan never gained the presidency, his efforts delayed the money changers for 17 years from attaining their next goal, a new privately owned central bank for America. In 1775, the American Revolutionary War began as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. Though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as the prime cause, that King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing and using for themselves. 
in turn forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England at interest, immediately putting the colonies into debt. And as Benjamin Franklin later wrote, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, greed-filled men associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that produces the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, two specific powers are inherent in central banking practice. The control of interest rates and the control of the money supply or inflation. The central bank does not simply supply a government's economy with money, it loans it to them at interest. Then through the use of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the entire structure of this system can only produce one thing in the long run. Debt. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For every single dollar produced by the central bank is loaned at interest. That means every single dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percent of debt based on that dollar. And since the central bank has the monopoly over the production of the currency for the entire country, and they loan each dollar out with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the central bank again, which means the central bank has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created, which in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, creates even more debt. The end result of this system without fail is slavery, for it is impossible for the government and thus the public to ever come out of the self-generating debt. The founding fathers of this country were well aware of this. By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few central banking systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking and business world were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds. And in the early 1900s, they sought to push once again legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and public were very weary of such an institution, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. So, J.P. Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by publishing rumors that a prominent bank in New York was insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would cause mass hysteria, which would affect other banks as well. And it did. The public, in fear of losing their deposits, immediately began mass withdrawals. Consequently, the banks were forced to call in their loans, causing the recipients to sell their property, and thus a spiral of bankruptcies, repossessions, and turmoil emerged. Putting the pieces together a few years later, Frederick Allen of Life magazine wrote, The Morgan interests took advantage to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed. Unaware of the fraud, the Panic of 1907 led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who had intimate ties to the banking cartels and later became part of the Rockefeller family through marriage. The commission, led by Aldrich, recommended a central bank should be implemented so a panic like 1907 could never happen again. This was the spark the international bankers needed to initiate their plan. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended disguised their names when en route to the island. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. 
and in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. Later, Woodrow Wilson wrote, in regret. Congressman Lewis McFadden also expressed the truth after the passage of the bill. A world banking system was being set up here, a super state controlled by international bankers acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. The Fed has usurped the government. Now, the public was told that the Federal Reserve System was an economic stabilizer and inflation and economic crises were a thing of the past. Well. As history has shown, nothing is further from the truth. The fact is, the international bankers now had a streamlined machine to expand their personal ambitions. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. For example, from 1914 to 1919, the Fed increased the money supply by nearly 100%, resulting in extensive loans to small banks and the public. Then, in 1920, the Fed called in mass percentages of the outstanding money supply, thus resulting in the supporting banks having to call in huge numbers of loans, and, just like 1907, bank runs, bankruptcy, and collapse occurred. Over 5,400 competitive banks outside of the Federal Reserve System collapsed, further consolidating the monopoly of the small group of international bankers. Privy to this crime, Congressman Lindbergh stepped up and said in 1921, under the Federal Reserve Act, panics are scientifically created. The present panic is the first scientifically created one, worked out as we figure a mathematical equation. However, the panic of 1920 was just a warm-up. From 1921 to 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply, resulting once again in extensive loans to the public and banks. There was also a fairly new type of loan called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, the margin loan allowed an investor to put down only 10% of a stock's price, with the other 90% being loaned through the broker. In other words, a person could own $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This method was very popular in the roaring 1920s, as everyone seemed to be making money in the market. However, there was a catch to this loan. It could be called in at any time and had to be paid within 24 hours. This is termed a margin call, and the typical result of a margin call is the selling of the stock purchased with the loan. So, a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, Bernard Barak, and other insiders quietly exited the market. And on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in in mass. This sparked an instantaneous, massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It then triggered mass bank runs for the same reason, in turn collapsing over 16,000 banks, enabling the conspiring international bankers to not only buy up rival banks at a discount, but to also buy up whole corporations at pennies on the dollar. It was the greatest robbery in American history. But that didn't stop there. Rather than expanding the money supply in order to recover from this economic collapse, the Fed actually contracted it, fueling one of the largest depressions in history. Once again outraged, Congressman Lewis McFadden, a longtime opponent of the banking cartels, began bringing impeachment proceedings against the Federal Reserve Board, saying of the crash and depression, it was a carefully contrived occurrence. International bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge the rulers of us all. Not surprisingly, and after two previous assassination attempts, McFadden was poisoned at a banquet before he could push for the impeachment. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve bankers decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill from before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. If you look at a dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. 
It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives our money value is how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power to bring entire economies and societies to its knees. It's important to clearly understand, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is about as federal as Federal Express. It makes its own policies and is under virtually no regulation by the U.S. government. It is a private bank that loans all the currency at interest to the government, completely consistent with the fraudulent central banking model that the country sought to escape from when it declared independence in the American Revolutionary War. Now, the control of the economy and the perpetual robbery of wealth is only one side of the Rubik's Cube the bankers hold in their hands. The next tool for profit and control is war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, a number of large and small wars have commenced. The three most pronounced were World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. World War I. In 1914, European wars broke out centered around England and Germany. The American public wanted nothing to do with the war. In turn, President Woodrow Wilson publicly declared neutrality. However, under the surface, the U.S. administration was looking for any excuse it could find to enter it. In a noted observation by Secretary of State William Jennings, the large banking interests were deeply interested in the World War because of the wide opportunities for large profits. It's important to understand that the most lucrative thing that can happen for the international bankers is war, for it forces the country to borrow even more money from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest. Woodrow Wilson's top advisor and mentor was Colonel Edward House, a man with intimate connections with the international bankers who wanted in the war. In a documented conversation between Colonel House, Wilson's advisor, and Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary of England, regarding how to get America into the war, Grey inquired, What will Americans do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House responded, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States, and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into war. So, on May 7, 1915, on essentially the suggestion of Sir Edward Grey, a ship called the Lusitania was deliberately sent into German-controlled waters, where German military vessels were known to be. And, as expected, German U-boats torpedoed the ship, exploding stored ammunition, killing 1,200 people. To further understand the deliberate nature of this setup, the German embassy actually put advertisements in the New York Times telling people that if they boarded the Lusitania, they did so at their own risk, as such a ship sailing from America to England through the war zone would be liable to destruction. In turn, and as anticipated, the sinking of the Lusitania caused a wave of anger among the American population, and America entered the war a short time after. The First World War caused 323,000 American deaths. J.D. Rockefeller made $200 million off of it. Not to mention the war cost about $30 billion for America, most of which was borrowed from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest, furthering the profits of the international bankers.